If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com backslash FPA. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. If you would like to earn continuing education credit for your FP&A certification from the Association of Finance Professionals for listening to the show, go to the show notes for details on how to earn the credit. Finally, if you enjoy listening to FP&A today, please go to your podcast platform of choice, click the subscribe button, and leave a rating and review of the show. And now, on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FP&A Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special holiday edition of FPNA Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy. FPNA Today is brought to you by DataRels, the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis. Today, we are lucky enough to have two leaders with us. I'm delighted to have Howard and Brett join us for the show. So, Howard, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot, Paul. Brett, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, Howard, this is your uh, repeat of performance, right? The second time on the show? Yeah, so good you asked me back. Exactly. Data Rails and us, we're so happy we wanted you back. So we're excited to have you for this episode. So we're going to do something a little different today. We have about roughly 15 questions that we're going to run through around fp &A. And we're going to have different people answer those. These are common questions that have been found on Reddit and other places that people have been asking throughout the year. But before we jump into the fp &A questions, since this, this is a holiday episode and we're all in the spirit, we're going to ask both our guests what their favorite holiday movie is. And we can see from Brett, Brett just put up a mug. Was that the Grinch? I've got Prancer. Ah, I've got a set of Christmas Prancer. mugs with all the reindeer on them. So I picked nice. Prancer for today. Yep. I like it. Yep. And uh, how about yourself, Howard? What's your favorite for Christmas? Well, favorite Christmas movie. Uh, I'm not normally one that likes to watch movies too many times, which isn't good at Christmas because you get the same 10, don't you? But um, Love Actually, I think being uh, being over here in London, uh, this is a really kind of quintessential film. Um, I think everyone in the UK likes it. And I like the different stories. You know, it keeps me a little bit interested. There's always something I've forgotten from having watched it 10 times. So that that's one I can put up with. That That's a good one. You know, it's hard for me to pick favorite. There's a couple. I, it's going to be between It's a Wonderful Life and The Christmas Story. Yeah. So that, that, that's a fun one, both in a different way, but those are probably my two favorite. All right. So we're going to go ahead and jump into the questions and we're going to give the first question to you, Howard, to get your thoughts on this. How difficult is it for someone to switch industries in fp &A? Yeah, I think historically perhaps it has been quite difficult um, when i'm thinking about hiring quite often the hiring manager the first thoughts are someone needs to have this experience they need to have this certification and they need to have done this job in the same industry for a couple of years and that that seemed to work in the past um but, but i think now things are changing you know things are moving a lot more quickly in fpna and for me anyway, when I'm hiring, I, I want someone smart and coachable. Like People can pick stuff up, right? And, and it's it's a ton more interesting for those individuals if you're learning about a new industry. You know, The thing that people most talk to me about when we're hiring is they want to develop and they want to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a great way of doing that is, is by moving around industries and learning about all sorts of different areas of business. I, I would agree with that. And, you know, one thought I would add is, when I'm hiring someone, much more important than industry is the mindset they have, their attitude, their willingness to learn. Industry can be learned, right? Now, yes, there are some industries where maybe you need somebody with experience, certain roles, and it's going to be very difficult to make that switch. But in general, I think much more your overall skill set, your willingness to learn, and your attitude will help you switch, helps you switch industries than anything. Any thoughts, Brett, that you'd add? Yeah. I'd say like by level two, um, I found that earlier on in your career, it's easier to switch. There's just more universal stuff within FP&A that'll apply. Mm -hmm. Like, can you, can you do a forecast? Can you build a report? Like once you get to management and above, I do sense that it is just harder to switch because that's the point where you like industry specific context really starts 
to like play. It's like a differentiator on your resume. So you're, you're going to be competing against somebody who's done 10 years of budgeting in a SaaS company. Like it's just hard to stack up against them if all the other sort of pieces of you look the same on paper. So that's, I think maybe just a little bit of nuance there. Analyst level, easier to switch, manager level and above, maybe a little harder. And I would totally agree with that. And I think part of that is too, right? It's a funnel. There's a lot more analysts than there are VPs or CFOs. So it's much easier to show somebody that you can do the work. The deeper you get down the funnel, the harder it becomes, you know, for a couple of different reasons, what you mentioned, and just the fact that there's a lot less jobs as well. So it becomes more competitive for those jobs. Yeah. All right. So, so next question we have here, we'll ask you this one, Brett, and I think all three of us can speak to this one. Do you need a CPA? If you land an FP&A job right out of college, do you need your CPA? Well, I don't have mine and I'm doing okay. So I'd say like, I'll start there. Um, there's a, I know a lot more FP&A folks that don't have a CPA than those that do generally. So, you know, if you just kind of look at where the cultural trends go, I don't, I don't think you need one. Does it help? Sure. Um, I'd say like, don't do a certification unless you're interested in doing the certification. Uh, so I, I'd say that's my perspective. I, I just don't, I don't know a ton of CPA, fp a folks. Those that do have it though, I will say this, those that do have it are really talented usually. Like I'm usually really impressed with their knowledge of accounting fundamentals plus the fp a piece. Like it is kind of like a, a bonus if you're able to do it and and you enjoy it. So I don't have mine though. So that's kind of my official answer is like, I just sort of push against the uh, sort of the, the concept that you need it in order to really land a good FP&A role. I don't think you do. I, I don't have mine as well. And Howard, if I remember right, you don't have yours either, right? Yeah. Yeah. Same really. I think it's that balance between, did you know you wanted to work in finance from a really young age and, and you've taken that really linear path and you've gone deep into it and, and that has some benefits like Brett said. Um, but also how about getting some broader experience? You know, we're we're increasingly asked to be creative in FPNA. So actually drawing on some other different diverse backgrounds, maybe taking a little while to decide what you want to do and getting there a, a more roundabout way. Like there's no harm in that either. Agree. And, and I'll add one thought here, you know, because people ask about CPA. But if you look, there there are many different paths into FPA. We'll talk about that next. But you're seeing a lot more people come from consulting or investment banking, right? They have very strong modeling skills, very strong strategic skills. You have some people coming from a CPA. So the reality is there's many different routes. There are some more traditional than others. And sure, is a CPA valuable? Yes, it helps you de- understand a deeper level of accounting. And if you can bring that with the business acumen, it's great, but it's not required by any means. I think we're all aligned there. So next question, kind of along these same lines, a little different, but from your perspective, Howard, how easy is it for someone or hard to break into FP&A that has a non-traditional background? You know, maybe they're coming from teaching math or whatever it might be, but you know, something that you wouldn't typically see. Yeah, I think... This is becoming more common, what I'm seeing. And yeah, I, I think the people are open-minded to it. If I think about kind of my dad's generation, job for life, linear pathway, <laughs> you know, you've got a you've got a CV and and it's shown exactly every step made perfect sense. Uh, things are different now, I think. The, the skills that we need to move up in FPNA, they're not so technical. And a lot of the technical stuff's been automated away anyway, all the data science um, guys are doing it. So yeah, personally, I'm like really open to kind of different career paths. I um, actually had uh, some some CVs come through recently and there was one candidate uh, had a background in dance and she'd uh, kind of done dance and then was ready to be a professional dancer and then broke her leg, injured her leg in a car accident, couldn't dance anymore. And maybe five years ago, I might not have kind of spoken to her, thought maybe she's not a great fit, but I thought, no, I spoke to her and yeah, she was brilliant. She blew me away in the interview. So real learning for me to just be open. As we said before, if you've got the right attitude and the right mindset, then that really trumps kind of having a 
perfectly linear career path. I would agree. Brett, any thoughts you'd add to that? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, the, the science backgrounds are really valuable in finance. I know that's kind of an interesting thing to say, but a lot of the work we do in FP&A is very hypothesis driven. It can be at least where like you form a hypothesis, you like go down the different testing routes to say, did this answer the high? It's very systematic in some ways. Analysis can be at least. So having that like science background, I've seen that work really well because mm -hmm. that's just the world that they live in. Um, that's that's one of my favorites. I've I've had peers of mine who have been wildly successful who come from like a biology background. Uh, that's really cool to see. So I'd say like science, math, very closely related, and I'd say like even that hypothesis testing within it's it's a, just a valuable skill to have. Yeah, I'd say some of the best I've seen have often come from engineering. They have that very yep. logical, very math driven, but I've also seen some that come from totally different backgrounds. Like you mentioned, Howard, like the, the answer. So I think the, the basic answer is it can be hard to break in with a non-traditional background, but it's doable. And I would say that's where you want to network and try to make connections so people can see your skills beyond that. Because if all you're doing is applying and letting the applicant tracking system and the AI filter you're not going to get interviews in a non-traditional background. So you need to you need to stand out in unique ways, but you can be highly successful without a doubt coming from a non-traditional background. All right. So next question we have, this one's for you, Howard. Any advice on how you run slash lead the annual budgeting process? Yeah. And I want to come from this from a slightly different angle and say, how shouldn't we do it? Uh, as I remember an old manager of mine used to say, talked about creating an industry. So like we've created an industry around this budget process and it feels like if we're not careful, we do some budgeting and then we just make it more and more complex, more and more complex. And then we end up with the budget being like an aim in itself. And we're really losing sight of some of the fundamental things that we're trying to achieve through budgeting. So do you need to create some financial targets and KPIs, yeah, sure you do. Um, make sure that the shareholders are getting their return and you know, the, the investment is right. But actually, I, I like to say like a budget never made anyone a dollar, right? So you can spend four months budgeting, but you're not going to make any more money. In fact, you're going to make less because all of your senior people have been drawn away, dragged into budgeting. So I, I'd say that um, the phrase about plans are useless, but planning is essential really rings true for me. So what am I looking for in my budget process? Like good enough is good enough. You're never going to get it right. You just need to be kind of right enough. So don't obsess on accuracy because none of us can see the future. Crazy thought that we could do. Really for me, it's about alignment. So just getting all the people in the room aligning on what you're doing. And then I think where FP&A can really add value is prioritization. So the amount of times I've seen a muddled strategy because data science aren't talking to product, aren't talking to marketing. We're in a great position to bring everyone together. And, and what people don't always understand is that we can bring in FP&A is we can size things up. So we can say, look, there's always a hundred things to do. Let's concentrate on these five because they're going to make the biggest difference. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking for rather than having a really long process and coming out with some really detailed numbers. I like, you know, I think everybody's heard that, the comment you made where basically planning is everything, right? If you don't plan, you plan to fail, but the actual plan is, it's pretty much inaccurate from the time it was created. Nobody exactly hits their numbers. So I think you made a great point of one, you know, don't spend forever on the process, but make sure fp &A has the opportunity to bring people together. The one th the, the two things I would add is one, make sure you have a detailed calendar when you start and hold people to dates and expectations. So make sure you're clear with them up front on templates. You've done the training, that calendarization, because I've seen it where if you, if you have a loose calendar and you don't communicate it, it can just become a nightmare because everybody's going to submit things late. All your dates are going to slide. Then you're going to spend all night trying to get it done and wonder why you have this big plug at the end of the year that is just going to come back to bite you in the butt. Yeah. I like taking what both of you guys are saying and just like putting it into a 
kind of my process. Like I like to start out with just an underlying, I call it the base case forecast. Like what do we think next year is going to look like? Yep. I think Paul, to your point, like if you don't start out with a healthy base case forecast, you could get into December and go, oh shoot, I forgot about this pick or this, you know, PL account that I forgot to juice up because X, Y, Z, some tax, blah, blah, blah. Like, so really starting with a solid base case forecast, like I love to do that in the summer when you've got a little bit of breathing room, you, you give that a couple rounds because people don't always think holistically about every single expense that they're going to have next year, how many licenses they're going to have for that software. So I'd say like that's probably big tip number one. Um, big tip number two that I always do is like put a plug in your expenses. I know that's kind of like a dirty word, but like, especially if you're thinking about next year, like if you think about your own personal budget, there's things that you know you're going to spend money on, but there's things that like we just, I'm, I, I can't predict that I'm going to spend money on that. So having a little bit of a placeholder, a slush fund, call it what you want, discretionary CEO account, like a few bucks for when next year you come up with some expense that you had no idea you owed, you can pull it out of there instead of saying like, hey, we've got to go cut this department or cut this thing because we're over budget. And I'm not even advocating that you do that anyway. But I'd say those are probably my two tips that like very practically as you're going through budget season, like those are going to set you up for a little bit more success than than not. And just having the 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 battle wounds to, to say like, hey, you know, don't make the same mistake I did early in my career. I, I like your point I of uh, wanting some padding, whatever you want to call it. I've heard some people say one, two percent. Maybe you often I've seen what happens is, all right, our typical churn in hiring is X. We'll leave it. We'll, we'll assume a lower number so we have yep. some extra room in there. You know, things like that. You adjust that. Um, when you said slush fund, I had a laugh because from an accounting standpoint, we all, you know, your slush fund is like, uh, go to jail, right? I worked for a company one time where they told us on a call, um, yeah, we have the slush fund. When we need revenue, we just pull from it. And no. the uh, person who managed the accounting stuff said, ah, we'll be looking at that and cleaning that up. Like, no, that's not how we do accounting. So that was what came to mind when you said slush fund. So it kind of made me laugh. But I, I know funny. exactly what you're talking about. All right. So next question here that we had, and I think I'll speak to this a little bit, and then you got, let you guys add any thoughts. So one of them was, any advice for someone out there who is trying to obtain their first VP of FP&A role? So the first thing I'll add is none of us on the call have been a VP of FP&A. Second thing I'll say is, as some companies, a director does VP work, a manager does VP work, you know, titles are not consistent across companies. And then in general, the best thing you can do to allow yourself to move up early in your career, it's standing out in your work. But don't don't sleep on building relationships and the networking and what Howard likes to call the soft skills that he preaches quite a bit, those human skills. Because at the end of the day, as I've heard it said, your your technical skills generally get you your first job, but your soft skills are what get you promoted. So any thoughts either of you would add to that? And I'll just throw it out to both of you if either of you want to add any thoughts. I just build on what you're saying, Paul. But yeah, exactly. As you said, I agree. I think the Technical skills, it's what we get taught early on, uh, and we think that's going to get us to CFO level, and then quite quickly we figure out that it won't do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but certainly networking. And networking isn't scary. It's just talking to people, really, mainly talking to people that you already know and being open to new connections. So it doesn't have to be something you do at a conference with a name badge on. Um, just go out there and talk to people. Uh, have some lunches, make some connections, make some friends. Simple as that. Um, probably other skills I found you need stepping up. Um, communication, for sure. I mean, there's a, that covers a multitude of sins, but um, communication will make a massive difference. Um, and within that sort of subset, stakeholder management, uh, if you're again, talking about running the budget process or if, if you're senior in FP&A, you're really going to need to be able to connect with all of the senior business stakeholders and kind of bring them along with you. So somewhere between sort of stakeholder management and influencing um, in kind of subtle ways and, and making people feel heard and valued are, are all going to kind of help you to succeed. Got it. Appreciate yeah. that. I, the only Brett. other skill that I'd add 
and I think you guys would nod your heads to this one, is uh, the ability to set and execute a vision within your finance team. So Mm -hmm. uh, when you're younger in your career, you're really just taking orders. You're doing what you're told. Um, You might push back here and there. You might have some opinions, which is awesome. But like developing that and having more opinions about how it should or ought to work, if you start having those feelings of like, this is how it should or ought to work within FP&A or finance, I think that's like a director VP level skill set. Because once you get to director VP, nobody's really telling you how to do your job for the most part. They're just sort of expecting that it gets done. It gets done well, efficiently. Uh, so I think that's that's maybe the, the piece that I'd say is like developing that ability to have a vision, have an opinion, and really move towards it. And I'd say like us three probably have three different perspectives on how fp should run. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be the right vision. It has to be your vision. You have to really believe in it and be able to like cast that vision down to your team so that they can execute on the vision. So that's the piece that like I've really sunk my teeth into over the last couple of years of like, okay, I really need to have an opinion on like, why, why should I think about reporting in this way or forecasting or analysis in this way? Great, uh, great point you added there. I'm really glad you added that one. Cause yes, as, as you move up, being able to think of the vision and how things should be set up and how they should work is really important because you're going to spend a lot more time on those type of things than you are in the day-to-day weeds. Every level you move up as a general rule, you spend less time on the analysis and a little more on people and relationships and all those other things that are so important. All righty. So ne- next question we have, and this one's for you, Brett. How do you develop KPIs? How do you think about them for a company? You come in, there's no KPIs. What do you do? Yeah. So in that scenario, if you're coming in with no KPI, it's probably the wrong approach. I'll go, I'll, I'll pull a Howard on this one and go like what not to do. Uh, <laughs> the wrong approach is to set up 100 KPIs and just burden the organization with administrative pulling KPIs, right? If there's no culture of KPIs, then you're not going to change culture overnight. You're going to want to introduce a few. Uh, and and from a finance perspective, and, and really like, Within FPNA, we try to be stewards of the business, not just financial KPIs, but financial KPIs are a great place to start. So like revenue, operating expenses, or operating expenses as a percent of revenue. So there's some really typical big financial KPIs that you can really anchor to. Um, as the culture gets developed, let's just play this out and assume like we've been there for five years and we're starting to develop this culture of KPIs. They're asking for more. They want more. So then what I'm typically doing is I'm going down to like, my revenue model. So I've probably got a revenue model as an FP&A analyst. And I'm going to say, okay, what's really driving revenue here? Is it, this is like a website direct to consumer business. Is this like website visits are driving revenue? Is it my conversion rates driving revenue? Those are some cool KPIs that you're going to start to pull in to really help the senior leaders understand like, hey, if that KPI goes up, revenue goes up. That's a good thing. Okay, I can focus on this KPI. So for me, it's all about start high level if you've got a culture of not a lot of KPIs. But then as you drill down, the drill down is, in my opinion, really going into your financial models and your revenue model, your expense model. Like, what are those key things that like when they move, the whole business moves? Those are going to be the KPIs that I'm going to track. 100% agree is what are your leading indicators? And what are those drivers that really move the needle? You know, if it's something that's pretty immaterial, why do you really need to track it? You got to ask yourself, What's the time commitment? What's the value? Does it align with the strategy? Can people influence it, right? And if the answer is yes to those type of things, then it probably should be a KPI. If the answers are no, it may be something you track, but it's not really a KPI. It may be that occasional thing you look at for you know whatever reason. So I think you make a great point. And then starting small if you don't have the right culture, if it's not something people are used to. If you start with 100, you're just going to overburden everyone and it's going to fail under its own weight. We've probably all seen that in projects we've worked on. I know I have. You know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders. Multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. 
Data Rails takes data from all your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex, consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So the next question we had here is how do you decide on when you should upgrade to an FPNA tool? Who's ever been in Excel hell? Raise their hand. All right, great. That's the first sign. But what is that? I think there's a few things that lead to that. One, you know, if you're finding it impossible to collaborate you're, and you're sending files constantly back and forth over email, that's a sign. Yes, there's ways you can manage that through using Power Query and using SharePoint or, you know, using Google Sheets or whatever. But if you're really struggling and there's a lot of, a lot of back and forth, you have a lot of linked files, you have, you know, 50, 100 spreadsheet models those are signs that it's probably time to upgrade. If it's, you know, if you're working late night, really late nights, every night during budget because of the model, not because of meetings or other things, but because you're trying to get the model right, you have big errors. Those are all signs that you want to look at adding something that can help with those things. Is a planning tool going to solve your problems? No. As I like to say, it's people, process, and then technology is an enabler. It's not your solution. So I think that's important to keep in mind because most transformations fail. Many software projects fail. Most people who implement a tool still use some level of spreadsheet. So make sure you know what you really want. You've thought about the strategy. You start small as you implement it. So those are the thoughts I'd add. Anything you guys would add to that? Well, I'd say... If you want to find out the problems in your business, then go and talk to customer services. And if you want to find out the problems in your planning and consolidation, then go and talk to the teams that are pulling that together. Because I think what quite often happens is you get kind of well-intentioned people in those teams that know where the issues are and they spend a lot of late nights kind of stitching it together. <laughs> and probably the senior people don't see the, the challenges. Um, that go into kind of manually planning and consolidating. And probably the only time or the time they feel the pain, the senior people is because they're asking questions that they think they should be able to get the answer to that's not possible from the system. So I think a dual approach, kind of have an honest conversation with people about how much time they're manually spending. Um, but a good indicator for a senior person is people kind of blowing out their cheeks when you're asking them for, uh, you know, a fairly simple piece of information. That's a great point. A good sign for a senior leader that you need a tool is I'll have to come back to you that for everything, right? That's also a sign sometimes that you don't have a dynamic model built. So there can be some training to address that, but it's some combination. And then you have the average worker. It's really, okay, how long is it taking them? Because management doesn't always see the hours that go in and a real appreciation for how difficult and painful it is. Because sometimes if you have a really skilled person, they can mask a lot of those issues and someone who's willing to work really hard. And you probably, if that's the type of person you have, one, you're going to lose them if you don't do something. And two, they're probably someone that could give you a lot more value working on other stuff. So you know, those are a couple of things to go with. Now for the part you've all been waiting for. We're going to talk about what Excel functions or features have been most popular on FPNA today. I have here the list of all the functions and features that people have voted for through over 80 episodes. And we're going to talk about the top five as part of this special Christmas episode. So I have my festive, festive hat on, I got my beard ornaments on, and I'm ready to go. So I just need a drum roll, give myself a drum roll. And we'll start with number five. So the fifth most popular feature or function for Excel is XLOOKUP. 
XLOOKUP is the new dynamic array lookup function. Personally, it's my favorite of the uh, lookup functions. So that's in fifth place, XLOOKUP. We have in fourth place, Power Query. In the words of Kathy Svetina, when she learned a Power Query, it was like the heavens opened, the angels came down. She said it was a transformative experience. That's how I feel about Power Query. Number three, and this one had nine votes in third place, is Pivot Tables. Good old standby, able to aggregate all of our data and look at it in many different ways. Number two, with 10 votes, is Index Match. It's a favorite among many people. We often see the argument, hey, what's better, XLOOKUP, Index Match, or Choose, or VLOOKUP, or some other function. So it's a very popular one that a lot of people love to use. And number one on the list with 13 votes is VLOOKUP. I think a VLOOKUP is old faithful. It's how many of us first learned to do lookups. I think many of us, when we first learned VLOOKUP, was like, wow, I don't have to manually do this. And it opened a whole new world to Excel. I've heard some people say it's kind of like that gateway formula that opens Excel, opens the door to learning new and exciting things. So, you know, in addition to those top five, we had people vote for many other features and functions. Outside of the top five, the most votes anything got was three. So we just had a, a long list of different formulas and features. We had one that you could relate to above. We had someone vote for lookups. So let's talk a little bit of who voted for these, some of the people. So, you know, on the index match, we had Chris Riley, Christian Wittig, CJ Gustafson, uh, Parth, Shruthi, among others. You know, at Pivot Table, some of the people that voted for that, Francesca Valli, um, Ryan Abdullah, Jeanette DeRazio. Some of those people who voted for Power Query would be me on my episode. We had that one mentioned in our uh, counting FP&A episode. Saeed is a big Power Query. And as I mentioned earlier, Kathy. On VLOOKUP, you know, a lot of people mentioned that, and many people said it was for nostalgic purposes. It was one of the first functions that really helped them gain power in Excel. And so some of the people we'll mention there, Amy Omond, Ben Murray, Drew Murphy, Glenn Hopper, Mr. AI, Mikas Kroms. In our marketing episode, it was mentioned. I think it was Christian Wittig in that episode. Nick Brignola and others, you know, mentioned VLOOKUP, Nicholas Boucher. And then we had a few people that mentioned XLOOKUP as a favorite. Asif Masani, Matthew Bernath, some people in our data visualization LinkedIn Live. So, you know, we have a lot, of, a lot of different functions and features that people love about Excel. Finally, as we wrap up, I would just like to mention it's been a fabulous year and it's only been possible because of each of you. So I hope you guys all have a happy holidays. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the Excel functions and joining us throughout the years. We've had guests all over the world. You know, we've had guests from Europe, from Asia, from North America, South America, Australia, you know, pretty much the globe. And we're really proud of that. We're really glad that we can bring you great people from all over the world. And we just ask if you enjoy FPNA today, it was a gift back to us at the end of uh, the year, this holiday season. If you could take a few minutes and give us a rating, we'd love if you can give us five stars. If not, give us whatever you think the show is worth and leave a review. Write what you like about it. It helps us keep going. It helps us grow the podcast so we can have more listeners. So next, next question we have here, this one's for you, Howard. What advice or thoughts would you give around management reporting if you're in a difficult kind of turnaround situation? You're in a situation where things aren't going well. Any any thoughts there? Yeah, so I had this example. Uh, seems like a long time ago uh, in a property company um, and uh, notorious for having kind of uh, cash flow issues. So what we did there was really just focusing on the short term. So get your cash flow forecast as, as good as it can be that's going to be critical um i'd also say kind of an element of realism about how it's going to be so you probably want to come up with a range of scenarios and 
be prepared that the bad case scenario, like that may well happen. So yeah, what are you going to do if that does happen? Um, and again, we really pulled it back to fewer metrics. So you're looking at a much shorter time frame. You're you're trying to get through the month effectively. And yeah, I would say in, in that instance, the the interesting thing from my perspective was it it's a good time to be in finance, even though it's it's really tough. Like we had four or five rounds of redundancies. Um, lots of people that I knew well went. Um, but as a learning experience in finance, we had kind of a lot of um uh, influence and a lot of say in that, um, purely because we were so close to kind of the numbers and, and what we needed to do to hit kind of banking covenants and um, all of those other things which become critical in those difficult times. Yeah, and I'll add a little bit. I wasn't so much a turnaround situation, but we had a situation where all our growth over the last three years, we'd spent more than a dollar for every dollar we gained, which that will put you in a turnaround situation if that goes on long enough, right? That A clear sign is if you have multiple years where your expenses are growing faster than your revenue, that's a sign that eventually you're going to run out of cash. And so I think what that taught me there is, you know, really that turnaround situation, we went back to the basics. What are the right ratios? Where are we out of line? How is this industry set up? And then we slowly went through each function. How do we streamline this? How do we improve processes? And there were some, some consultants brought in. It was a private equity situation. And it was a couple of year project where we restructured the whole company and right-sized the, you know, the P&L and the expense base. And so I, I totally agree with you the idea of really watching what's important streamline, reduce things, get back to the basics. Because it's amazing, growth will cover a multitude of sins. And I see Brett and Howard both nodding their head, right? I've seen situations, well, we're growing, so just spend it, doesn't matter. Yeah, but it's not a good use of our money. Yeah, Paul, there was a, there was a great uh, saying from around that time that our CEO used to say, and it's, it's only when the tide goes out, you see who's not wearing swimming shorts. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Right. You see who uh, who has done a poor job of managing everything when that tide goes out. Exactly. Who's who's exposed. Any thoughts, Brett? I see you kind of nodding your head. There. Think, yeah, you guys, you guys are both saying it, but I'll, I'll call it out like preventative approaches to this is the best. Like <laughs> if you're in a turnaround situation, it's already sort of too late. Like finance can really help and get you out of it. Kind of to Howard's point, like it's not the end. But if you really understand the the value chain of like, how to, how a customer comes in and then what happens. And like, if you truly understand the business and you're an fp a and you just see some things that just don't look right, like that's the time to start to talk about it. Like, hey, we're spending more money than the customers are bringing in. Or, hey, we're shifting towards our least valuable customers. There's some of these KPIs that you can really set up early on to say things aren't shifting well. And I think I've always been fortunate enough to work in companies where we have like a really sort of sophisticated early warning situation. So we just don't find ourselves in turnaround situations. We see very quickly when when some little KPI starts to tweak the wrong way, we go and turn a dial to help it like turn back. So I'd say like, you know, preventative medicine on this one is the best. Obviously, uh, not all companies are following that, which is why FPNA is so needed in turnaround situations. But yeah. Yeah. It, it's like health. The best way to prevent mm-hmm. having health problems is preventive, eating right, exercising, yeah. taking care of yourself. Doesn't mean you won't end up in a turnaround situation with your health or a business, but it's much less likely you're better prepared. So I, I think that's great advice is always looking to prevent it if possible. Sometimes you can't, but a lot of times you can. Well, next question here, and this one's for you, Brett. Can you uh, explain kind of how the headcount process works for budgeting, how you've typically seen it work? I know headcount is usually the biggest expense. It can be very painful at times. I know I've been through more than one reconciliation where nothing quite ties and you're trying to get it to work. So any any thoughts there, anything you, you know, to kind of help explain how you typically have seen that work? Yeah, I'd say there's there's usually two two levels to this. And this is a differing opinion. This is my opinion. So I'll start there. Uh, there's companies where you plan headcount by person, literally person, person mm-hmm. by person. If they've got an ID and a name, they're on a spreadsheet and they've got a dollar next to them 
and you can plan them out by month for the next X number of months. So that's one way that's usually smaller companies or just companies that want to have a tighter grip on their expenses from a headcount perspective. Usually headcounts like 70% of a company's expenses. So you're going to want to have a tight grip on that. There's companies once you get large enough where you're doing it more at a um, like a team or a department level or like a, kind of a, I'll call it like a top down. Like we've got this number of people in this department and they cost this much. So uh I'd say there's just two different approaches, neither right nor wrong. You're going to have more control on the first one, but more administrative burden on the first one. Second one's a lot easier to plan for, frankly. But when things don't line up perfectly, and they ne- they really never will on the second one, because you're not dealing with specific people in specific months, you're always going to be a little bit off. Your, your margin of error is going to be bigger. It's probably the best way I can say that. So sort of knowing what your approach is, and then having good expectations around it is probably the first like key to headcount planning. I'd say next is like, I'll go back to what I said earlier, have a good base case, like make sure you've got the right people in there to start your budgeting process. If if people have termination dates, make sure those are updated. If if there's future hires that are already planned for, make sure those are coming in. Um, and what I'd say is like from there, there's it's just this game that you play, which is like, how much revenue do we need? Okay, well, how many people within sales are going to help us get that? Okay, well, we just need We just added 20 more people. When are they going to start? How fast can you hire them? Are we going to do external recruiting, internal recruiting? So really going through the process takes a while. It takes months to do usually. Um, And then the end result that you want to be in, at least personally, is, hey, if we need to increase sales next year and we need to increase them starting January 1st, that means we need people in their seats in October ramping up so that way in November, December, they can start to be productive if this is like a sales culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that way they can actually produce January 1st. So you're not actually just starting behind the eight ball. And Q1, you're already behind budget and you mismatched when people would start versus when they'd be productive. So there's this whole whole sort of like spider web of interconnected financial modeling that I think is critical to understand underneath your business. But again, it goes back to like what we've been talking about, which is if you understand the business and sort of like if I add a salesperson, here's when they're going to be productive and here's when they're going to add this sort of revenue, but that's going to drive more volume to my customer service team three months later. But then my implementation team needs to be staffed up to anticipate. <laughs> like it's a whole spider web of it. And I'd say as long as you understand that spider web, you're in a good spot. If if you're sort of like eyes glazed over right now and going, what is he talking about? I'd say this is a really good time to start to think through like, how does this whole spider web work? When I add a person here, or I add a revenue dollar here, what's it do downstream with my whole financial model? So no easy answer there. But um, say that's sort of the uh, overall picture that I like to think of when doing headcount budgeting. And I like that. And, I, and, and I'll add just a little bit of my thoughts. So you know, first is getting the baseline right, making sure you have all the existing pl- employees in the right cost centers, departments, whatever they may be, right titles. You know, If you're going at a salary level, the salary... But make sure you have a clean understanding of your baseline picture. Next, especially if you're in a big company, make sure everybody's using the same assumptions for merit increases, for timing, for bonus, for tax, for all those things. Those, If you don't get those aligned, it can cause a lot of headache. So at least agree on those. So if you're right, you're all right together. If you're wrong, you're all wrong together. And you're not spending time going, well, why did you use 8.2 and I used 8.1 and So I'd say align your assumptions at a corporate level if you can. Then the third thing is what you got you mentioned, Brett, is understanding the relationships, the drivers. Okay, if I add if I'm gonna add 20 customers to my plan, I need two more customer support person, one implementation person. Well, that means I need this. And then the last thing is really around what I will call um, the assumptions with the business, talking to HR. Can you realistically hire those many people? Understanding capacity. And then the last is just what method you use, which you talk about. Is this capacity planning? Is this person planning? Is this role-based planning? Is it a mix? And I'll give an example. One of my first years supporting a new business, we had a call center with about 100 people and I didn't have a model for a call center. So I just staffed it with people. And that's not the way to forecast a call center. You want to forecast it based on capacity. How many calls can they handle and how many people does that need to be for that? Then at a role level, I actually did it at a role. So next question I have for you, Brett, this is one for you. If someone knows nothing about FP&A 
any advice you'd offer on how to teach it? Where do you start? Yeah, it's a great question because uh, the setup to this question is like you need company financials in order to forecast and like report on company financials and people go, well, where do I get that? How do I learn that? Nobody's going to give you their company financials. So, I mean, there's a tricky way. Like you could get like a QuickBooks, like fake company data file and use that and start to forecast. But truly, I think the best way that I found is just to do a personal budget. So, so like it's going to force you to think about the things that are actually important. And a personal budget is very similar to a corporate budget. Obviously, there's differences, but if you can if you can make it your goal to forecast what your cash is going to look like in 12 months from now, I can almost guarantee you you're going to be as sophisticated, if not like 80% as sophisticated as a lot of companies out there. And if you can get reasonably close to forecasting that cash and you have to think through like, okay, when's my paycheck coming in? When are my expenses going out? Do I use the credit card expenses or do I use the cash expenses? You're going to start to think about like, well, am I accrual-based accounting or cash-based? And there's words to this that we use that are corporate and uh, like financy that might throw you off a little bit, but like you'll have gone through the thought process that a lot of thought process that a lot of people do when they go through FP&A. So that's sort of my trick. Um, if you can create a really cool personal budget that forecasts your cash, I think you're you're pretty darn close to what most companies do from an FP&A perspective. 100% agree. And uh, Chris Riley, who teaches a ton of financial modeling, always tells people how I learned to model and where I started was my own life. Mm-hmm. It's like, if you're asking me where to start, start by modeling your your life, your expenses. You'll start learning about cash and assets and liabilities and how the three statements work together. And so it's it's a great place to start because at, at its base, if you're doing your own story, you are doing planning and you're also looking at actuals. So you're experiencing those things on a personal level that go into a corporation. So great advice there. I like that one. All right, Howard, what what resources have you seen out there that are available to help people become better at FP&A? Any kind of favorite resources or thoughts you can share there? Yeah, yeah, this is a, a really interesting one because it's changed so much recently. Um, as we spoke about earlier on, I think the, the technical side's pretty well covered, um, that you'll see lots of resources for that. But the soft skills is really where you can kind of make a difference and put yourself ahead of your peers. So um, resources are all around you for sure. So if you're interested in working on a certain skill, say presentation might be a good one to work on or networking, just find someone that you know that's good at that and just watch how they operate. Talk to them. People are, you know, people like to talk about things that they're good at. You can say, look, I've noticed you're a really good communicator. Um, where do you think I can improve? What are your tips? How have you kind of learned to do it? So it's not a resource that you might think about all the time. You're probably thinking about looking in a book, but actually watching and listening to people that are skilled in things you want to get better at is just a, a perfect way to learn. And, and if you're working with them, even better, because you can see them, what they're doing every day. Um, and, and you get that really nice feeling of learning from someone that's good at something. And, and then you can start the trial and error process and make a few errors, but you've got the support of that person that is kind of helping you to improve at the skill. Thanks. I think having somebody is great. That's a great resource to look around those. I'll put a plug in for listen to FP&A today, right? See, I got, I got some nodding because they're like, oh, we're on your show. So of course we're going to say yes. But, you know, I think there's a ton of resources. I think a great place, like you mentioned, Howard, is to start with the people around you. And then beyond that is look at the subjects. You, know, you can go out to LinkedIn, you can go to Reddit, you can Google it. There, there are so many things. You can find a book. The reality is the resources are not the problem. It's determining what's important and then finding out, you know, finding the way you want to learn about it. Uh, at least in my opinion, I think in today's world, data and learning is never the problem. It's figuring out how do you focus and what are the best resources and use of your time. And real quick, I think it's pretty specific yes. too to each person. So, and like, I, like I'll say this for myself, reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, hey, Brett, here's where I'm at. Here's what I'm doing. Where, what should I start with? And like, I could probably fire off pretty quickly exactly where you should start. I'm sure both of you could do the same. There's a ton of people out there that are willing to give you that, mm-hmm. like, what's the next couple steps? And then if you're willing to take initiative and go, hey, we just pointed you to a LinkedIn learning course or some other sort of course out there, uh, you can go hit that. 
Uh, otherwise, like we can give you that path, the next couple of steps. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are more than willing to, to assist you. A hundred percent agree. I mean, I get people asking me questions all the time and I do my best to, to give them advice. The one thing I'll add, if you're going to ask someone on LinkedIn, the more specific you can be, the more we're able to help you. Don't just send a note saying, can you please find me a job or how do I get a job? Those are so vague that it's really difficult for us to provide you any meaningful advice. So the more you know about what you want, the much e it's much easier for us to point you in the right direction. And I saw both of you kind of smile when I said that, because I'm sure you've received some messages like that, where you're just like, I have no idea where to start because you've given me no information. So the next question people asked are FP&A certificates worth it? You know, there's obviously going to be a lot of different opinions on this, and there are different certificates certificates out there. I just did the FP&A certificate from AFP. What I will say is a general rule, certificates can help set you apart, and they can show a level of competence. Are they required? By no means, no. Plenty of very successful people have never got a certificate, in some cases, not even a college degree. Can they help you, especially early in your career? set you apart? Yes. The more senior you get, I would say the less valuable they become. And so those are my thoughts there. And there's there's a lot of good certifications out there. Some people want to do the CPA and that's a great route to go. Some people want to get their FP&A certification. Some people want an MBA. Some may get a financial modeling certification. There are different reasons for all of those. It's really about where do you want to be? How do you want to set yourself apart? and then deciding what makes sense for you. All righty, so that's all we'll say on certificates. We're going to jump into the next question, and this is kind of a fun one because I'm sure we've all struggled with it from time to time. So I'm going to ask all of you this one, both you, Brett, both you, Howard, and then I'll share my thoughts. So we'll start with you, Howard. How do you switch off work? How do you de-stress, especially during budget season? It's a challenge. Um, in theory, exercise, but I don't do enough exercise, so that's not... It's not really a, an answer being true to myself. Um, one thing that I found really helps is what's called digital minimalism. There's a book by a guy called Cal Newport, and it's all about just kind of managing the amount of time you're online. But not only that, it's also the complexity. So even the number of apps you have on your phone, the number of newsletters you're signed up to, um, you know, that the way that you receive your notifications. So his kind of mantra is just dial it all back. You know, we, we get stressed out. We've been on a call back to back calls all day working remotely. And then we're chilling out and we're like looking on our phones and checking all our notifications and clearing them all down. And, and I used to do that. Generally I found there's a path to a bit more peace by almost like managing the peaks of your um, kind of overload in the modern world. And what I found myself, sometimes the behaviors that I use to get myself out of a stressful situation actually make it worse. So a good example might be, I'll just be on my phone checking the sports scores for half an hour. But what I actually need to do is just go and talk to my wife or I need to go out for a walk or I need to just think about something else. So yeah, that's one I found. It gives me a little, little bit more balance. Thanks. Appreciate that, Howard. That's good advice. Brett, how about you? What's your uh, go-to when you need to turn it off, so to speak, and de-stress. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo everything Howard said. I'd say I've taken it to pretty big extremes at times too, from like a positive extreme perspective. Um, for a while, when it was stressful, I did a digital Sabbath. So I would Friday evening turn off my phone and not turn it back on until Saturday at sundown. Do like a full 24-hour sort of call it a detox from my phone. Cause I just, I'm with you, Howard. I sense like the always on, especially with notifications on my phone, on my computer, it just feels like you're always getting pinged. So I think that awareness, and, and that's different for everybody. Some people are more okay with the stress that comes with the notifications and they can manage that. For me personally, I wasn't. So I had to, I had to do what I had to do to manage that. Um, so that's maybe an extreme. I'd say like, don't be afraid to go extreme if you need to. Um, I'd say the other thing that I've really worked on over time has been the perspective of like, um, I forget who said it earlier, but it's like the budget has never made a dollar. I forget what the saying was, but I really liked it. Uh, 
And just reminding myself like, hey, if I really mess up this report, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, the number's wrong. I look silly. Okay, then what? Then what? So for me, you know, I think a lot of the stress comes from the thought of like, what if I don't do well? What if I don't perform well? So putting myself in that sort of worst case scenario and finding out like, oh, it's actually not that bad if I mess up this report. And then reminding myself, how many times have I messed up a report in the past? A bunch. Are things okay? Yes. Okay, cool. I can move on with my life without carrying that stress throughout the day. So I think part of it's a little preventative of, can I, can I just carry less stress through the day? And then I won't need as much sort of extreme measures nights and weekends. But I would echo, echo everything Howard said. Take a walk, exercise, get outside. Like there's a lot of science out there that's going to back up. Like that's the best way to reduce stress. Yeah, I, I will agree. I uh, find when I find time for exercise, I do a lot better. And I've really tried to push that this last year. All right. So we're coming near the end of our time. We just have a few more questions and we'll wrap up. One I'm going to do is kind of a, a fun one that we like to ask people is just a couple questions to get to know them. So you get about 20 seconds to answer these. So these are going to be, you know, try to make them quick and short. If you could meet one person dead or alive, who would you meet and why? Christmas time, I'm going to go for the, the emotional one. Um, but actually, my, my dad passed away when I was quite young. So whenever I hear this question, I'd be like, yeah, let's uh, have, have a drink together. That'd be cool. Yeah, you're you're not the first who's gone with that one. We had someone else saying, "Can I pick my mother?" Right? Because yeah, they, there's nothing as important as family, especially with holiday season. You miss them, so I appreciate that answer, Brett. That's great. I mean, that's really sentimental. I was gonna go with like Eric Clapton. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a guitar player, and for years I would like practice his riffs and like sit in my room and play his songs. So I just think it'd be cool to understand. Like, it's such a different world. We're in the corporate world. He's in the music world. That'd be really cool to like, understand like, what's it like? How was your life? Was How cool was it? Thanks. Appreciate that one. So the next one, I'm going to skip you on this one, Howard, because we have your answer on a previous episode. So if someone wants to know Howard's favorite Excel function or feature, they can listen to his prior episode. Brett, what's your favorite thing about Excel? Favorite? It's got to be like the index match combo. And I know I'm a little old school here. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Like, I just won't touch anything in the last five years because I have my old habits and they die hard. So like X lookup <laughs> deserves no place on my keyboard. It's all index match. And I know I'm going to catch flack for this, but look, <laughs> I've been around for 10 years and I'm just, I'm a dinosaur. I get it. Lots of people love index match. You're, you're, you're in, you're in good company there and it's a good function. I, I like using X lookup most of the time, but I totally get it. So I appreciate that answer. All righty. So now we're going to, Move on to last question before we uh, let you guys tell us how people can learn more about you and any last thoughts. So we're gonna we're gonna split this one, kind of be fun. Howard, I'm gonna ask you what has been your biggest challenge in FP&A this year for 2023. What's been your biggest challenge? I'd say prioritization. So too much to do. How do we make sure that we're doing the right things in the right order? prioritization is always a tough one. All right. So this one's for you, Brett. You get the second half of this question. What do you see as the biggest trend going into 2024 for FP&A or maybe biggest prediction? Yeah, there's a lot of really cool tools that are out there. Like, I'm not just saying that. I Like, I see things launching every day of the week that's like this new tool that solves this problem. So I think there's a lot of really cool stuff out there that's like from a technology perspective that's really fun. I'd say like people really wrapping their heads around like, does this tool solve my specific problem and how can I implement it? Kind of, Paul, to your point earlier, like there's not a high success rate in implementing tools or transformation. So I'm, I, think, I think more people are going to wake up to the fact that there's a tool out there that solves their problem and they just got to go find the right tool to plug into their problem. Got it. I appreciate that. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and wrap up. So the first thing I just want to do is thank both of you for being on the show. Really appreciate your time today. And just ask, if somebody wants to get a hold of you or reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? So Brett, what's the best way for somebody to contact you? Yeah, so I've got a website that I started, a newsletter. It's called Forecasting Performance. It's forecastingperformance.com. So it keeps that easy. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter there. I try to respond to everybody via email. So I get a lot of people on a daily basis that talk about their situation, what's going on, any advice, and I'll try to point them in the right direction. So that's a fun way to, for me to connect and then every week I share sort of a, a tip or trick through my newsletter. Um, totally free. Uh, it's just sort of a fun way for me to sort of share my 10 years of FP&A experience with people that are interested in that. 
Great. So make sure you send us all that. We'll put it in the show notes for everybody, the newsletter and your website. Howard, how about you? Yeah. So best place to find me is on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. Just come and say hi. You'll find me posting content about finance soft skills. That's my passion. Um, helping to improve that area, which I think is a, a huge um, growth area for, for many people in finance. Right. Well, thank you guys both for being on the show. Really appreciate the time today. And we'll hope everybody has a good uh, holiday season, whether that be Christmas or whatever holidays you may uh, celebrate. You can see we got a little bit of festivity going. I got the beard. He has the mug. Howard has the hat. So we'll wish everybody a happy holiday season. And thanks again for joining us, Howard and Brett. Thank you.